really going to leave it up to the panel of experts here to give us advice on what the best strategies are for monetizing your applications and talk about some of the trends that they're seeing, what's working and what's not working. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Adam. I'm from Life Street Media. We are a company that specializes in monetization that is running ads in a developer's application to help make them money or user acquisition for an app developer looking to acquire users or distribute their application in the market. Awesome. Uh, Steve Bagdasari, uh, Vice President of Business Development at Fixu. Uh, we are uh, one of the leading uh, user acquisition platforms, uh, single SDK solutions um, for app promotion in the marketplace. 100% uh, transparent. Uh, the premise of the platform um, is uh, essentially allow transparent buying across any relevant uh, mobile media channel that's out there, whether that be ad networks, ad exchanges, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you name it, platforms integrated with them. Okay. I'm Doug Dickerson, so I run the developer services part of uh, Pensite Media. Uh, if you're not familiar with Pensite Media, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of Sprint. Um, what my group focuses on is working with developers to say, hey, let us be your ad operations team. Um, drop the SDKs in your apps. We'll manage everything about talking to all the different networks, uh, direct sales, et cetera, um, and basically send you a check at the end of the month. So uh, kind of an app outsourced almost uh, ad operations team. So, so Doug, before we started the panel, we were talking about the transformation that we've seen personally in Maybe we're the old timers here <laughs> um, in the monetization models. And maybe just to level set uh, for the people in this room, can you comment on some of the monetization tactics that developers are using? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely changed, right? So, as you mentioned before, the, the beginning of the App Store uh, you know, from Apple really changed everything. But, you know, prior to that, uh, like I mentioned before that we you know, worked for Handmark. We're, Carriers would pay us to put our software on their phones, preload them. And, you know, <coughs> fast forward a few years, and now we would pay carriers to say, "Hey, preload us and you know get us get us on your phone." And uh, you know, while there is still you know premium and you know people buy premium, I think in-app purchase is a great monetization way uh, for a lot of apps. Though um, you know, they really free is what the users expect, and you know, monetizing through advertising is is in many cases, I think you're you're, you're your only option uh, to make money. Um, Adam, <laughs> we were, and I'll get to Steve in a minute, but we were talking about when does it make sense for uh, an app developer to move from a premium or freemium monetization model to an advertising model. Are there different life stages? Should it be thought out right from the beginning that they would look at that model? Can you comment on that? I see a lot of developers really spend a lot of time on both, and not purchasing and advertising. And I think what really makes the most sense depends on the individual app developer, the individual property who's looking to monetize. For the people that are spending their time on app purchasing, they're ignoring the advertising side. For people that are watching with advertising, they're missing out on in app purchasing. Something to note is that when you're advertising, you basically are auctioning off your ad space for multiple demand sources. Each one, of those, each one of those demand sources is doing their best to monetize the space for you. Within app purchases, you're virtually on your own to tweak your own application to make the most money. So if a user comes in, the content has to hold them, the content has to uh, help achieve the next level of success, and then has to incent the user to end up purchasing. The publisher, the developer, is responsible for each one of those steps, each one of those models, testing, tweaking, on their own. With advertising, all you have to do is you have space, you offer it out to the highest bidder, and then they do the optimization. Our company spent eight years building out optimization engines to maximize the effectiveness of the ad space. So, depending on how your application lifecycle goes, you can either spend the time with your app purchasing on your own, which makes significant money, or you can auction it off to the ad providers, which can also make you significant money as well. So let's talk about that 
tease that out a bit more. Um, when it comes to advertising, it's largely about eyeballs. So how would application providers start to attract the high volume of users to attract the advertisers? Yeah, so um, you know that's definitely right up our alley. You know, we're 100 percent demand, so obviously buying the right type of media uh, is, is essential to the clients that work with us. Um, you know, there's there's a big part of the, the UA world that is data, right? Um, and you know, a little bit of the, the dirty secret is there's a lot of buying that happens where people are just looking to, to hedge their bets and go as broad as possible. Uh, and they want to target off of device, they want to target off of country. We were actually talking about this before the panel. Um, and you know, they buy, they, they price negotiate, they buy as much as possible, and eventually that some of that stuff converts. Um, to, to really start to justify the, the higher CPMs, uh, you know, we got to start moving in, into a position where um, timely data is being shared. Uh, you know, the, the developer uh, who is utilizing whether it's a service like Fixu or they're, they're going direct um, to different uh, channels, um, that they're, they're having the right type of mindset of um, their conversion costs, right? You know, they want to be able to monetize at a certain level, but uh, unfortunately, oftentimes we're, we're either paying too much or they actually don't know what they're trying to pay, uh, and then we are forced to essentially price down the market. I mean, um, Adam pointed out uh, prior to this panel, you know, a, a great article that's definitely worth the read, but a lot of game developers right now are, are you know, hemorrhaging money. They're, they're paying acquisition costs that are uh, well above what the actual return is for that user that they're converting onto the platform. So, um, you know, data, data, we always talk about data, 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 but I mean, it, that really is the, the next level of what's going to uh, appropriately raise the cost of, of ECPM. So the savvier app developers that really understand their monetization models, they understand their client life cycles, they're breaking out the right cohorts and segments uh, on their user side, uh, that's starting to come into fruition. But, but that's that's the one piece that we really haven't built around standards yet. So, so, with, so with advertising, I mean, so, Adam, you were saying that, well, get started, it's easy, we bid out the inventory, but then now uh, what I hear Steve saying is, well, you really need to make sure that you have a measurement analytics system, too, so you understand what you're spending and if it's worth your while. Right. The publishers that are succeeding today are testing the market, measuring their success, testing again, and iterating, on and on and on. Uh, one of the things that we see in publishers that are successful in the market, both with acquiring users and doing advertisements to monetize their app, is running a, a test market. So launching in Canada or Australia where the behavior is around the same as the US. The US is a very difficult market to penetrate. It's a very saturated market. So they test, they iterate, they measure, and they test again. What CPMs can be expected? I mean, this is for any of you. So to provide guidance here and to make sure uh, the app providers are not overpaying. Right. Uh, I mean, CPMs are, are truly all over the map, right? So part of it depends on geography is hugely important, right? So you're going to get a higher CPM for a, you know, an eyeball in the U.S. than you are in India. Um, it's you know, that geography makes makes a really big difference. Um, when it really, when you, when you take that out of the equation, really the next two pieces that, that matter are what are your click-through rates? So I know that, you know, you think it, well, I'm, I'm getting paid by impressions, my click-through rates don't matter, they absolutely matter. So what your click-through rates are are going to determine how much money you're making from a CPM or a CPC campaign. So click-through rates are definitely key. And then the second piece is knowing your users so that you can target them. Um, and targeting can mean a whole bunch of things. There could be a big data story where you know something about the user independent of the app they're using and you're targeting based on that. Um, or if you have a really targeted audience for your application as it is, you know, that's a really simple sell. Right? If you know that most of your users meet a certain demographic, it becomes a lot easier to, to target ads to them and to sell ads. Can you put a metric so, on the list, the multiplier, what targeting would give? Is there a... Uh, again, it's going to depend, a lot of it depends on the demographic, right? So we manage ads for a, a, a medical-based application, right? So that demographic, most of the users are, are healthcare professionals of some sort, doctor, pharmacist, et cetera. Um, so once we know that, then the CPMs, you know, went from, you know, 20 cents to $8 on average, right? 
if your demographic is something that's not as desirable, then knowing that demographic is still valuable, but it becomes a little bit less valuable. So it's, it's really a hard thing to answer. I mean, you know, we have, again, CPMs going from 10 cents to, you know, $8. It, it depends on the app, it depends on the audience. Okay, just to chat in there. The, um, I know I've been in the audience of these a lot, and when someone says it varies, it really helps to understand why it varies, because it sounds like kind of a cop-out, like, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and it does. We're the same way. I see eight question. cents to 18 bucks CPM. And really what it comes down to from the app developer's perspective, the publisher, is how desirable is your media? How effective are you at driving the demand dollars? And what I mean by demand dollars is a very simple supply and demand equation. Who out there is competing for your, for your supply, your supply being the ad space? The, the $18 CPMs that we see are very good at driving the dollars that we have to spend. And the dollars in the market, I'd be interested to see what you guys think about this as well. Allegorically, 80% of the demand dollars right now are coming from installations of other apps. So your app, if you want to make money out of advertising, has to be pretty good at driving installations of other apps. And if it's not, or you don't want other apps to be installed or to be advertising your app, you're going to be pushed the 20% of brand dollars that exist today. Now, everyone's betting on when brand dollars is going to grow, right. but we've been betting on that for three years now, we haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think it is growing. I think it's it's starting to move in that direction, but you're right. I mean, most of the ads, you know, you, you launch any application and, you know, Candy Crush is going to be half of the ads, right? Because they work and they're measurable. You know that the download happens. So being able to, to get attribution based on a brand advertising, I think that's when more and more of the, the, the Okay, the, the you just started, you over there. took my next <laughs> question. <laughs> What's going to uh, drive the brands to spend on it, that? So I think, uh, I think attribution is key, um, targeting is key, um, you know, and it's, you know, they want to know that the app was served, who it was served to, um, you know, one of the factors that, that comes into play a lot is affects kind of what your effective CPM is, is um, your unique users. Right? So you may have an application um, where people are using it constantly, and so you get 10 times the ad impressions that you get from another application that people don't use as frequently. So that's good, that's fantastic, but when you go back out back to the advertiser, they're going to have frequency caps on that, and so it's really how many unique users do you have over a given time period that, that starts to play into that. So how many would be compelling to a brand advertiser, or is it back to the target? What yeah. is it? Yeah, there's definitely some numbers. I think you need you know a million uniques a month. Is starts to get people. Yeah. You know, yeah. The only, the only thing though is the re reliability of, of being able to hit that audience, right? I think that's why, from from a mobile standpoint, people get excited about platforms like Twitter. Or, I'm sorry, like Facebook, because you hear stats of 97 percent accurate. Right? They can deliver against the segments that you want to put out there. We don't in mobile. We don't have the, the world of, of cookies, right? We don't have the third party cookie pools that we can tap into. Um, I, I think there's also a lot of, of questions around the engagement of ad units in the mobile applications. I mean, tablet being a little bit different, but, you know, even if it's, uh, you know, full, full rich media interstitial, is that still as, you know, compelling as, you know, uh, an ad that you could put somewhere else from a branding perspective? But for, for me, you know, again, we live in the UA space, so, I, you know, I have, some, I have some developers that, you know, will pay astronomical CPMs because they can convert users on certain pools of inventory very, very well, and those users monetize out. I have certain advertisers that will pay top dollar CPMs to retarget on certain uh, media channels to be able to, to re-message to, to certain uh, users that may or may not have converted or, or they want to get re-engaged. But the brand side, you know, the, the one thing that I, I do think that, that does hold us back um, is, is just the, the accountability of the audience that I'm driving against. Contextually, there's no question. There's alignment there that you can play off of. But the accuracy, right? The accuracy being able to hit that audience. We're, we're just starting to come into that, right? I mean, you start looking at the way of, of IDFA, IDFA or, or uh, IMEI um, is being utilized, and you know, you have some of these guys that are, that are doing some really interesting stuff on the statistical side, but we do need to graduate to that hurdle to, to really get the guys that are not just the first movers, you know, the, 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 the bulk of the dollars that come out. So, so Sprint, as a mobile operator, you have a lot of data on yep. Consumers um, that you can't necessarily expose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, and part of it depends on how you're using it, right? So, um, 
every carrier treats it a little bit differently, but it yeah, I was general, getting down to the ID. Do, is there an identity? Um, where can you help with that identity targeting? Um, yes, but there's some rules around it, right? So, um, it, what the, the approach Sprint has taken is that if we're going to use any information that we get because we're your carrier and we know that, if we're going to use any of that for targeting an ad to you, you have to explicitly opt in and say, I want targeted ads. Even a device ID? Just so a device ID you don't need the carrier for, right? So IDFA, IME, I don't think we provide, um, yeah, we have our own unique ID, but it, until you tie that to the unique data that we have on the back end, there's not a ton that you can do with it. Uh, now, you know, what we're trying to be really careful with as well is say, okay, if somebody has opted in and we can send them a targeted ad, we still need to respect the rules around where that data can go. So we can't just blindly send that data back to the ad network to say, send a targeted ad based on this. We have to send it as you know, totally anonymous and say, here's a target segment that we want you to target for based on what we know. I think that gets data back. It's upon a, a, an important topic that you need to basically get out of that, which is we're at a very early stage in the advertising market. And the dirty little secret when it comes to advertising in mobile right now is that there's not a lot of targeting data out there, and even if you do have it, it doesn't really do that much good. We have competitors who will go out and buy a wide swath of inventory, and they'll target device and country, and that's all. And the reason why is because the advertisers themselves don't really know what to do with that data. If I get the age of a user, and I pass that on, I do it in, in a way that the application developer passes it to me, and pass it on to the advertiser, most of the times, the advertiser doesn't even know what to do with it. To go back to your question about advertisers coming here and brands coming to the market, it's going to depend on when they can get an ROI on the spend they have in the market, and they haven't figured it out yet. So to answer the question is, when are they going to be able to figure out the spend? When are they going to be able to figure out the data that they need to get in order to be able to attribute the spend and start getting positive ROI? As a publisher's perspective, it's important. You need to know that allegorically 80% of the demand that comes in is from performance dollars. You need to be able to capture that. If you have enough uniques or you have a brand that is interested in your inventory, how can you flexibly transfer your monetization efforts going towards those, those brand dollars? So you need to be able to, to change the market like that. Yeah. They, it's actually interesting. The, the brands that the brands that are, that are doing it really well, they, they take a, a, a very strategic UA position where they, they do user acquisition, they have a, a mobile app strategy for, for a purpose of building up a lot of first party data. And whether they use that data just for their, their own internal analysis to figure out um, where it went to invest on the UA front or, or on the messaging side, you know, and, and again, retargeting really now is, is starting to come into fruition where um, you know, it's viable and scalable. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's kind of the cost because the third party data may or may not be utilized in the right way um, and, it, and if it even exists, right? And I think. You know, again, there, there's so many, you know, just redundant topics that come up in, in, in conferences like this. But really, I mean, the guys that are doing the well, they're, they're, they're looking at how to build up their own first party um, uh, data so that they can do the analysis that, that will then be applicable rather than retroactive measurement. Do the um, developers and publishers, when they're working with you, have any control on the advertisers that they want to go after? How does that work? That's actually an interesting point. Um, I'd like to, to bring this up since I have a microphone. Um, it's important to realize as a publisher that by limiting the advertisers or targeting the advertisers that you want to advertise in your application, you're limiting the amount of demand that competes for your supply. Which is basically like saying, I'm Starbucks and I don't want to sell to people that wear suit jackets. You're, even if that is a small, small demographic. It still cuts down on the overall amount of, of demand that competes for your supply. The biggest underline of that is when I talk to a publisher who says, I don't want to advertise against other games. Now, if you don't want them to pull away from your user, you have to at least pull away from your user base. I understand that, but at least understand what that means to your ad dollars. And if your ad dollars make up a significant amount of the earnings that you have, Understand the impact, the 80% of the market that is no longer competing for your ad space. And guess what? When the other 20% finds out that they don't have to compete against the other 80%, what happens to your prices? So, to your point, you 
can target the advertisers, but keep in mind that it impacts your bottom line. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I did want to see if there were any questions in the audience. I want to make sure we're answering what you wanted to come here for. Okay, I think there's one right here. Oh, oh, wait, there's one in the back. I need glasses. <laughs> That's okay, that's okay with sitting. So you talk about in-app, maybe not taking advantage of advertising, and advertising <laughs> apps not taking advantage of in-app, but in the whole slew of productivity apps who are focused on business users, the last thing a business user wants to see is an ad. Your thoughts? Segment. Segment your market. Yes, your business user may not want to see ads, but that means that you're not making money off of all the people that are unwilling to pay for your application. Now, in the, all the people I've talked to, rule of thumb is that one in 10, if, you, if you've made a good application that has a good app purchase model, will end up spending. The other 90% of your users are not gonna spend a dime ever. So how do you segment them out and make some type of money off of them? Because it's costing you money to acquire them as users or at least support them in the application. So the, the companies who are doing really well today, and I'm sure you guys run into them all the time, are the users who make money off of what they call the whales, the people that are spending money. They learn how to identify them early in the process, and then they basically come to a point in the app where they say, this person's never going to spend any money, segment them out, and 90% of those users will end up making money off the ads. And if they leave, who cares? Yeah. Let me just add one but, thing to yeah, that. Because like, you have the history of premium models. Yeah, definitely. I think like one thing that, that we do um, as part of the one lab when we create our own apps is we make sure that with every single app, the user has a way to pay and get rid of the ads. Now, we don't make hardly any money with that. Hardly anybody does that. But they no longer complain about it. So it's, you know, back to the story about the business users don't want to see ads. Well, guess what? When I watch basketball on TV, I don't want to see ads either, but I'll, I'll put up with it, right? So, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So, you know, and I think just giving people the option that says, I can pay 99 cents and get rid of my ads forever, great. Now, if you have Nobody an, will do it, but they'll well, stop complaining. So let me, so if you have an app that sells for $10 a month, it's a business app, Maybe advertising yeah, is no, exactly. the economics. You're collecting ten dollars a month from them. Yeah. yeah, you probably shouldn't be advertising. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only caveat there is if you are making an application where you're trying to capture the market, you want to corner the market, and you want to own the entire market. But the difficulty there is that there's so many people that are doing that right now that they're spending ungodly amounts of money on an unprofitable business, and they're 12 months in and they're realizing there's no positive ROI model out there and they're, their investors are starting to knock on the door and say, where's my return? I think this next year, we're gonna see a lot of big companies start to have a lot of big problems because they're spending too much money and not making enough. The article you mentioned, it says, uh, 2014, prepare for a bloodbath because people are spending more than it takes to get in. As an app developer, understand your model and run in the black, or at least understand how to get to the black. And actually, just to, to build on that point, because I know it, it wasn't the, it wasn't directly the, the question was asking about, but to flip it on its head, um, you know, you segment, you're going to lose some users if you serve ads, you know, depending upon the, the experience within the application. But it's really interesting, too, the number of, um, you know, B2B type of applications that, that come through our system, and they have a very specific set of uh, content that they want to be able to, to serve against, or the types of users they want to be able to serve against, uh, and, and this kind of preconceived notion of where their app is going to be most successful. And they end up paying a much higher acquisition cost to get against a very, very smaller subset of media um, when, you know, actually if you, if you just took advantage of the way that the pricing economics are, uh, you know, in mobile media right now, when you went much broader, you, you might recognize that, you know, segments that, that don't necessarily, you know, seem intuitive for you to convert on, you, you do convert on. And look, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the guy who's using Bloomberg is probably the guy who's, you know, on Angry Birds on the train ride home at the end of the day. It's just how do you make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're paying the right amount for that type of impression being served? Fantastic. There's yep. a question here. Hi. Um, so it was similar to the question that I was going to ask, and it's basically looking for an argument of why I should show ads to someone who does spend money in our game. And I feel like, Steve, some of the stuff that you talked about, if you can target the right people that spend money, why can't developers pay top dollars for them? Or if you know their zip code, 
how, how can you cost out why it would be worth money this, uh, to show ads to people who spend? Um, so I think one of the reasons why people aren't paying top dollar, if, if that's kind of the direction that, that I would go down to answer that question, uh, I, I just don't think a lot of people are actually looking at you know, lifetime value or just, just ROI in general. I think a lot of people have an acquisition cost in mind and they have an idea of where they need to monetize out, but the next thing you know, you know, we're not looking at the data until it's too far down the road and you've paid too much for a user who isn't converting. So I think one of the core things that's going to happen in 2014 is that people are going to begin to pay more for those types of users that are doing well, uh, right, or, or the users who will pay more, but you know, to be able to serve ads against those types of, of, uh, of, of segments. So I think that's going to start to happen. I, don't, I think the reason why it hasn't happened or we don't still see it is the maturity of the market. I mean, we're still crossing this cusp. I think there, you know, there, there is going to be a, a, blood, a bloodbath, a flush out, a consolidation, whatever you want to call it, um, because people haven't been looking at the data in a timely enough fashion. Well, and that was what we were talking about earlier. It was how do you assess the value of a user? Is it how much they're buying, how much they're engaging? It's going to yeah. depend on the vertical. It depends on the vertical. It depends totally on the app, but, you know, there's a lot of missed opportunity there in terms of being able to, to appropriately price off of the, uh, you know, the, the impression opportunity at hand. It's just not happening. Well, look at the economics, too. Because if you get a user, let's say your user spends a dollar, you're going to have to have the same user see an ad a hundred to a thousand times to make up for that dollar. So from an economics perspective, if it's 10% of your user base, you may be better off just not having them see ads at all. And for the other 90% having them see the ads, so that will start generating ad revenue. But you have to look at the economics, you have to test, you have to measure to see if that ROI is going to work. I think there's time for one more. Uh, in terms of advertising dollars, can you compare and contrast the uh, the volume and CPM from direct sold ads versus you know the ads that you buy in exchanges or the price? That's a really good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start because I, I talk to a lot of a lot of publishers. First, I'll say that although I'm sitting up here representing an ad platform, I will say that I, I approach this in a very unbiased way because the only way that we as a platform are going to succeed in the business is if we have a realistic view of what's in the market. And now, the people that are doing it correctly are spending enough time on the optimization between direct, RTV, and other networks uh, versus the people who aren't. When I say the correct amount of time, there's a diminishing level of return on the amount of time that you spend on optimization versus the revenue that you'll make out of it. So, if you're ignoring it completely, you're going to lose out on a lot. If you just say, I'm only going to go with one ad source, regardless of who that ad source is, you're going to lose a lot of opportunity because they're going to be effective for a certain amount of your demand, but not all of it. But if you start diversifying against a bunch of other different places of demand, you're going to have a lot more demand competing for your supplies. You're going to see a better return, but you see a diminishing returns on that. So I'm sure Doug can talk more about this because he's people actually know that's what they do. Right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you think about a direct sale campaign, one of the key things in all of them is a frequency cap, right? So you may have a direct sale, but if you have the same user seeing ads all day long, you're only going to be able to serve them one or two of those. So you got to have some other place to go to get ads to monetize. So just for people like views. what do you think the frequency cap? What do you think that is? Why do you think that helps? Why do advertisers want it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's a. There's a fear of ad blindness, you know, number one, right? So they don't want to. If I look at Pepsi all day long, you know, eventually I stop seeing the Pepsi thing. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, the biggest piece of it. And then, you know, they've got a bunch of data, the, the advertisers, the agencies have a bunch of data on their own that say, you know, I need to hit this user this many times in this amount. Know, over this period of time in order to get a conversion. They're looking at the same kinds of things. So it's diversification of demand. I think some people also won't admit it too, but when you start getting into the smaller developer community, I mean, there's only so many creative assets that you have out there, so even though it seems totally counterintuitive to, to limit yourself in terms of your exposure, um, there's only so many assets that you can build for some of these guys, and they can only serve so many ads before they, they saturate what they have. Well, the way I look at it is, as a publisher developer, you own all the billboards along a certain freeway. Are you going to have only one source of demand? Like Coca-Cola can only put up so many different ads. 
so many different billboards. Do you want to advertise Coca-Cola down this entire stretch of the freeway? Do you think Coca-Cola is going to be able to pay top dollar for every single billboard? No, there's a yeah. scale of demand there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just ask one more question, and then we'll, we'll close it off here. Um, what future trends should the people in this room be considering when it comes to monetization? Flexibility. As a publisher, and I'm assuming a lot of you are publishers looking to monetize your app, you need to be flexible on either acquiring users or monetizing your app. And depending on where the demand dollars are coming from, you have to know where they're coming from and you have to be able to move quickly because tomorrow Coca-Cola might drop $15 CPMs and then they're gone. So how do you turn around and backfill that? So you have to be flexible to, to, to approach the changes in the market, and mobile is so early on, they're gonna see a lot of different changes, and you need to be flexible enough to be able to, to adapt to the market. Steve, any thoughts? Yeah, I just think, I just think there's gonna be better segmentation and collaboration between demand and, and supply at, at you know, kind of the, the top of the, um, the top of the heap of, of uh, developers that are out there. Um, and I think with that, you know, you're gonna get the situations where people are actually going to be able to recognize you know, where they should pay more versus where they should pay down, so it's not gonna be a price to the bottom for a long time. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'd add to that is that I think brands are going to start getting more and more mobile. I mean, you know, it's, it's been a lot slower than everybody expected, a lot slower than everybody predicted, but I think it's starting to move. So I think, you know, that's going to, I think, bring up, you know, bring up the water for all of us. That should give everyone a new opportunity. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for the panelists?